It's such a pleasure to be here. I wouldn't uh, be able to go on any longer without thanking a few people. First of all, my colleague Brian, a, a, an Ellisonian of, of uh, no small gifts. As you'll see in my talk, I've learned a lot from, from Professor Crable and his work. Crystal Lucky, a new friend, I hope a, a, an enduring friend. Uh, it's been just a pleasure getting to know you a little bit and to get a sense of your work and to have you bring your students to this talk also means a lot. And of course, it's, it's already been mentioned, but it's worth mentioning again, Joyce Harden, uh, the work that you did to pull this together and the last minute efforts to make sure we had audio is, is uh, definitely <laughs> without any kind of, uh, 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 you know, you couldn't go beyond it. We need the audio. You won't be able to listen to me for an hour without a little music along the way. Well, this is an unusual title, and I understand that it is. One is that the people who know Ralph Ellison may not know who Kendrick Lamar is, and the people who know Kendrick Lamar may not know who Ralph Ellison is. This needs to be changed if you find yourself in one of those camps, because there's a connection between these two figures, even though they're divided by so many aspects of distance, of craft, time period, geography, so many things divide them, but yet they come together in ways that I think are quite powerful. For me, it's also this connection between literature and hip hop that speaks to a story that's very personal and maybe is to you as well. For me, my career as a writer, as an academic, is about trying to bring these things together. When I was a graduate student, I would go to classes, I'd be learning the Western canon, from Beowulf all the way up to Toni Morrison, and in between classes I'd have my, my they didn't have Beats by Dre then, but I had some big ass headphones on, <laughs> and I'd be bumping the Wu-Tang Clan, Biggie, Tupac, whomever was big around 97, 98 when I started graduate school. That was my life, and yet I needed to bring it together to create a completion of personality. As Brian mentioned, my works have started to do just this, thinking about Ellison as a historical figure, as a political figure, and of course, <laughs> most of all, as a literary figure. He became a way into hip hop in a strange way. His, his writings helped me understand how to listen with greater acuity. And so I wrote about the poetics of hip hop, taking attention to the page, as well as to the stage in which hip hop is usually experienced. So for me, this talk is about completing these elements of myself. But it's also about something else. And this is a dirty little secret I want to share with you. And those of you who are in the profession will know this. But often, not always, but often, you come up with a title before you come up with a talk. <laughs> and that might have happened here. I might have received an email saying, what is the title for your presentation, Dr. Bradley? And I might have been on my cell phone and might have typed this out <laughs> and hit send. <laughs> now, it was under the influence of Kendrick Lamar, of listening to his most recent album, To Pimp a Butterfly, that I made this hasty decision, but I'm glad that I did. Because in coming up with the title, it made me actually come to terms with what I meant by this possible connection. It made me have to show and prove. So that's what I hope to do today, to begin to grapple with what it would mean for Ralph Ellison to listen to a 26, 27 year old hip hop megastar's latest release. Ellison, long dead, 1994, he passes away. Hip hop is in what they call the golden age, but I don't know if Ellison knew or cared. So, what would it mean for him to listen to Kendrick Lamar? What does that mean? Well, as soon as I came up with my title, started listening to the album, I started receiving emails, texts, other kinds of communication from friends and students who said, unbeknownst of you know, not knowing anything about my title <laughs> or this talk, saying, hey, you got to check out the connection between Kendrick's album and Ralph Ellison. 
what they have in mind. They sent me to this article on medium.com, one of several, where writers are making a connection between Ellison's 1952 novel, Invisible Man, and this album that's only been out, what, 10 days? What could it be? Well, the substance of it came down to a set of lyrics in one of the songs, King Kunta. These are the lyrics. When you got the yams, what's the yams? The yams is the power that be. You can smell it when I'm walking down the street. Oh, yes, we can. Yes, we can. <laughs> and in the second verse, when you got the yams, what's the yams? The yam brought it out of Richard Pryor, manipulated Bill Clinton with desires. So I want to situate this in the musical context and even in the visual through Kendrick's video for this. You can just get a quick audio clip of what this song sound li sounds like and what these lyrics sound like. <laughs> It's hard to turn it off, but <laughs> there's the yams, Kendrick's yams. <laughs> the yams are the power that be. That clarifies things. <laughs> so was Kendrick, listen, was Kendrick Lamar, forget Ellison listening to Kendrick Lamar, was Kendrick Lamar reading Ralph Ellison? That's the question that this song posed for certain readers. And I remember the passage in which the supposed connection exists it's in the 13th chapter of Invisible Man when young Invisible Man is moving from the south to the to the north he's gone from the city he's gone from the the, the country to the city he's walking around and he sees a street vendor on the on the streets of Harlem selling yams open them up, put butter on them, eat them right there. And Invisible Man is conflicted because at once it connects him to his legacy, to a Southern tradition in the African-American context and indeed in the African context. Yams being so fundamental to certain African diets, coming over to the United States, bringing the culinary know-how and involving uh, American culinary skills to craft this soul food, if you call it that. So Invisible Man doesn't know what to do. Part of him feels embarrassed that he should be the new citified Negro, the term that they would have used at the time, that he should not love the things that he used to love in the past, that he should give up the yam. But in the course of enjoying one, <laughs> he decides otherwise. As anybody who enjoy certain things, you get over the shame of it at some point, you say, no, this is what I love, and this, this is indeed what I am. I am what I am, he says in a play on words, riffing on that important passage from the book of Exodus. God identifying himself to Moses. Fundamental definition of selfhood. I am what I am. I am what I am. So. For Ellison's protagonist, this becomes a moment of conflict that once connecting him to a past, helping him assert his present, and adding a level of complexity as Ellison was wont to do. Because Ellison adds this line at the end of the passage where he says that when he goes back to buy another couple of yams, he knows that one of them is rotten inside. It's not all perfect, it's not all pure. It's not all about simply celebrating the past, but also moving forward and finding a way to do that with that past next to you. The website, Genius, formerly Rap Genius, offers this gloss on the lyric. This is a direct allusion to Ralph Ellison's Invisible Man, the unnamed narrator is walking down the streets in New York City when he smells yams, which triggers memories of his hometown in the South. Now that's useful if you begin there <laughs> and move to the book. It's not very useful if you stop there and you think you're smart, that you found a connection. <laughs> that alone will not make you a genius. 
but it's the starting point. Do I think that it's a direct allusion to Invisible Man? I'm not sure. It's not enough. It doesn't go to the next level of depth that the novel challenges us into thinking. It stands in, in the song, to matters of power. If you th see it in the second verse, what he says about Richard Pryor, Bill Clinton, it seems to be about vanity and power, the vanity that comes with power, not with heritage. So maybe this is a mismatch. Maybe there's something else going on. But if it leads you to read Invisible Man, <laughs> then it's all right by me. <laughs> in Invisible Man, we see a sense of this context, the birthmark, I am what I am. We think about this other question, though. I want to offer several counterfactuals, and this is the first. Ralph Ellison listens to Kendrick Lamar. Now, why would you even want to imagine this? Well, I want to offer a couple of reasons to suggest why you might. One is, is that for me, the great power of reading any form of literature is the way that the author and even particular characters can take up residence in your mind, can become a way for you to look out on the world with their eyes, to see what they might see, to interpret your surroundings as an invisible man might see it, or Madame Bovary, <laughs> or shoot, Hamlet. <laughs> Take whomever you like and think about that literary character. Think about the, even a particular author and the way that they might have influenced how you see the world. Well, the invisible man is that, for me, is one of those characters with whom I'll sometimes look out at the world, maybe even look out at you and imagine what he would see, what he would think. And so when I listen to hip hop, I often do it with his ears. Now, what does it mean to listen to Kendrick Lamar with Ralph Ellison's ears? That's a big question. Ralph Ellison was very much a man of his time. He was born in 1913 in Oklahoma City. He was born around the jazz and the blues. The music was in the soil of Oklahoma. Oklahoma had just become a state when Ellison was born. And it was very much a freewheeling society that certainly had its racism and division, but also had pockets of freedom, certainly on the level of culture. And so Ellison crafted a soundtrack for his life. Louis Armstrong, whom he cites so powerfully in the prologue to Invisible Man. Mahalia Jackson great gospel singer whose voice would be the soundtrack for the civil rights movement. And as we all do with taste, he would do his negative <laughs> soundtrack, the things that he didn't want any part of. Charlie Parker, too avant-garde. He didn't have the will to swing. Swing was so fundamental to Ellison. He wanted dance music. Charlie Parker didn't really provide that. If you hear his bleats and, <laughs> and squeaks that we now think of as part of the bedrock of jazz, for Ellison went too far away from the spirit of jazz that he knew from Armstrong and others. Miles Davis the same way. And so if you go to Ralph Ellison's record collection, you see artists like Armstrong and Mahalia Jackson, but most of all you see this man. Anybody know who this is? The great Duke Ellington. Ellington is important because he brings together that down-home jazz and blues with a symphonic setting, creating a vernacular form of music that draws upon Western classical traditions and American blues in the African-American vein. The National Jazz Museum in Harlem recently organized all of Ralph Ellison's records and put them on display, catalog them for people like us to look at. Imagine what this could reveal about you. Maybe not so much your record collection now, although vinyl's on its way back, they tell me. <laughs> but more, your playlists. 
Spotify, Tidal, whatever you use, Pandora, what stations you make. What can we tell about you by the course that you cut through your sonic world? Well, for Ellison, it's a list of just some of his LPs. <laughs> you see Ellington and Ellington and Ellington and Ellington and then a few others. What was it that preoccupied him about Ellington? Because I think that might be a way into understanding what might capture him about hip hop and Kendrick Lamar. I would argue that the thing that captured Ellison about Ellington was a sense of sonic experimentation within tradition. And that all begins in place. It's a New York City subway map. If you start from Ralph Ellison's home in Morningside Heights, right on the edge of Harlem, near Columbia University. It will take you about 40 minutes to get to the birthplace of hip hop in the South Bronx, even though probably maybe a mile separates them, if that. Get on one train, transfer to another, get off, get on a bus, and in the 1970s you'd be here, the South Bronx. Look something like a wasteland in the mid 70s. But yet, out of this, hip hop is born. Out of this blooms a culture. I imagine Ellison from his balcony on Morningside Heights opening his window one day and looking across at the park, maybe seeing some young guys on the basketball court with a boom box. And out of that come in the boom bap of early rap music, drifting from the South Bronx into Manhattan. You've got to grapple with this idea to understand why Ellison might have appreciated something about hip hop, even if it wouldn't have been on his playlist. Why he might also appreciate Kendrick Lamar's To Pimp a Butterfly. It's a term called the vernacular process. Ellison understands this term as a, a dynamic process of defining culture that emerges from the roots of the word itself, verna. Latin by way of the Greek, meaning a slave born of his master's house. A resonant term for me to understand an element of African American culture coming from the vernacular, not in terms just of language, but in terms of culture. This is vernacular process in action. No, it's not my lunch. <laughs> they did me a little better than that. <laughs> Anybody know what this is? Chitlins. chitlins. What are chitlins? They're pig intestine. The dirtiest low down part of the pig. <laughs> but yet, they're a delicacy, a southern delicacy. And in recent years, have become a delicacy even on some of the trendier New York restaurant menus. How does that happen? Well, it starts at a time of suppression and oppression in which people eat high on the hog when they're wealthy. That term, high on the hog, means you get the ribs and the bacon and the fat back, all the good stuff. Lower down, you get the intestines, the hooves, the part that you might throw away that often ended up in the hands of the poor and the black in slavery times. And out of this becomes a means of creating something beautiful, something enforced with something invented, the vernacular process in the kitchen. And so you imagine washing those intestines, then washing them again, and probably washing them another time. And then putting them in just the right mixture of spices until they become a delicacy. The vernacular process. And of course, you got to have your yams. <laughs> What's the yams? <laughs> now, Kendrick represents the cutting edge of a hip hop culture that emerges from the same tradition that produces something like chitlins, as strange as it might sound. And I want to tether it in something that Ellison said to show you how we might understand hip hop better through Ellison and how Ellison might have heard Kendrick Lamar's album. Ellison writes this. Uh, it seems to me 
that our most characteristic American style is that of the vernacular. But by vernacular, I mean far more than popular indigenous language. I see the vernacular as a dynamic process in which the most refined styles from the past are continually merged with the play it by ear, by eye and by ear improvisations, which we invent in our effort to control our environment and, and entertain ourselves. It's a gesture toward perfection, he says. So keep that in mind when we think about hip hop emerging through two, tur turn two turntables and a microphone, they say. Sometimes not even that. Maybe a lunchroom tabletop to pound out a beat and a mind to rhyme to it. Who was creating hip hop? Young people, 15, 16, 17 years old, largely black and Latino, men and women. Even 17-year-old kids trying to sport a mustache. <laughs> this is how hip-hop was born. The great KRS-One, second gen wave of hip-hop, said the following. He said that hip-hop was the final conclusion of a generation of creative people oppressed with the reality of lack. Run that back. <coughs> hip-hop was the final conclusion of a generation of creative people oppressed with the reality of lack. And what does that mean? It means what do you do in response to the absence of hope sometimes? You make a way out of no way, something out of nothing. Cultures across the globe have always done this. That's why we have a powerful 19th century Russian literary tradition emerging out of serfdom. And that's why we have the African-American form of the blues and jazz and hip hop that are now at the bedrock of American musical traditions. What do you do with something, with, with nothing to create something? What does an artist do without an, an, a, a, an art form before her? You gotta create one, that's what hip hop did. And so reflecting on what Ellison might have heard, I'm drawn to the prologue of Invisible Man where Ellison's protagonist unnamed, is in his underground retreat, listening to music, listening to Louis Armstrong, listening to what did I do to be so black and blue, and imagining what it would sound like on multiple phonographs played at once. He writes the following about sound. Invisibility, let me explain, gives one a slightly different sense of time. You're never quite on the beat. Sometimes you're ahead and sometimes behind. Instead of the swift and imperceptible flowing of time, you are aware of its nodes, those points where time stands still or from which it leaps ahead. And you slip into the breaks and look around. Invisibility, that central concept for, for the novel, one of Ellison's great contributions to American culture and politics even. Conceiving invisibility as a means not only of identifying the, the position of black people, but invisibility as a, a term that can move into other categories of experience to respond to Ellison's final question that he gives to his protagonist at the end of the novel. And is this which frightens me? Who knows but that on the lower frequencies I speak for you. All in sound, the beat, the breaks. And what is hip hop born with but a break beat? the sampling of a certain sonic moment of a song, the sweetest spot, repeating it until the dancers get in a frenzy. And only then does the MC, the master of ceremonies, the rapper, put words to hip hop. I want to take us to another counterfactual. Ralph Ellison lives to see Barack Obama elected president. I'm thinking here not of matters of policy, political affiliation, but of what it means and what Ellison would have thought it meant for a biracial American, half black, half white, to be elected president of the United States. The first thing to know is that Ellison had already thought about it. He writes in the second novel, which Brian alluded to, 
a narrative about a character of indeterminate race who rises to the Senate as a racist white senator from New England. Even then, creating this challenging moment in which Ellison suggests that blackness might already be at the highest reaches of our political culture. This is a note that Ellison scratched out for himself during the long composition of that second book. It took half his life to write it without ever completing it. And you'll notice what's at the center, a sketch of an American flag. This is an emblem to me of the centrality of the concept of Americanness to Ellison. Ellison, by many means, would be someone you'd imagine would have rejected America, someone who had experienced segregation, had been subject to racist violence, had seen it exercised at all levels of his life, but yet he clung to the ideals of America, to the promise harder than anybody else. That in itself is instructive. In 1958, half a century before Barack Obama was elected president, he writes the following. Ellison writes, I would like to see a qualified Negro as president of the United States, but I suspect that even if this were today possible, the necessities of office would shape his actions far more than his racial identity. Think of how Ellison was thinking of a black president. It may be useful to think about how we are today thinking about a, the possibility of a, a woman being elected president. I heard on CNN before I came in a commentator saying that a qualified <laughs> woman president, you know, speaking of Hillary Clinton and, and her, her, her run, and I thought that that's, a, that's an interesting word to use. And we say interesting, we want to say that troubling. <laughs> but it, it really echoed this, this quotation from Ellison. And of course, Ellison is writing from a context in which it would be an, an impossible dream to imagine a black person being elected president. Whereas today, as we look across the, the globe, many nations are being led by women. And it's, we're kind of starting to be the outliers. But Ellison was already on to this idea of Barack Obama, even be before Barack Obama was a reality, before he was up in Morningside Heights himself as a student, not far from where Ellison lived. I have this fantasy of, of Obama running on one of his daily jogs right past Ellison's apartment, and Ellison looking down. Be that as it may, Ellison and Obama are connected. They're connected not only because Ellison could have imagined someone like Barack Obama, but because Barack Obama had Ellison in mind. As a student, he writes about his experience of reading Invisible Man. He writes about being in high school and the importance of literature to him. He talks in the second paragraph here about over the next few months, I looked to corroborate his nightmare vision of what it meant to define himself as a black American. I gathered up books from the library, Baldwin, Ellison, Hughes, Wright, Du Bois. At night, I would close the door to my room telling my grandparents I had homework to do, and there I would sit and wrestle with words. Locked in suddenly desperate argument, trying to reconcile the world as I found it with the terms of my birth but there was a, no escape to be had. It's from Dreams of My Father, Obama's memoir. Grappling with Ellison, a schoolmate of, of Obama's, talks about how as a Columbia student, he was intensely reading and rereading for a few months a dog-eared copy of Invisible Man, Ralph Ellis, Ellison's existential novel about being black. It was a period during which Barack was struggling deeply with himself to attain his own racial identity. An invisible man became a prison, prism for self-reflection. A prism for self-reflection. The novel can be that for anyone, regardless of one's personal racial identity. It has that capacity, so focused as it is on the definition of self, 
but it has particular resonance when it comes to matters of race. And so here we have a reflection of Barack Obama now in the last years and months of his second term as a president. What does it mean? During the last election cycle, there was this famous image of Clint Eastwood gesturing toward an empty chair to Obama not being present as president. But also, for those of us who are readers of Ellison, to this concept, an enduring image of invisibility. The high visibility of dark skin, somehow, through the alchemy of politics and prejudice, perhaps, being invisibility. I'm guided by keen scholars, including my friend Brian Crable, who writes the following in an essay on Invisible Man and the Age of Obama. The discourse surrounding Obama's first term and his quest for re-election simply reminds us that Invisible Man's work is not yet done. It remains as important for us today as it is for readers in 1952. I would say even more important, Ellison's novel, 60 years after its publication, provides powerful resources for the interrogation of American racial identity in the early decades of the 21st century. Indeed, I believe that Invisible Man offers an unmatched perspective upon the still alive, still pressing discourse of racial binarism that, as Ellison told Kenneth Burke in 1945, has warped our culture and truncated our ability to think deeply and broadly. Powerful words for the enduring importance of this novel as a way of understanding not only Barack Obama as a political and social figure, but of our present state of racial society. One more thing. To look at the first family and to see this has to mean something, has to transform something in this tortured history, this bloody history of racist American society, of which Ida B. Wells, whose name is attached to this address, knew all too well. This image of this family representing the country, no matter what 47 senators might write, is profound. So I'll close with this. On this point, I got you a little longer. <laughs> this is from the out, pretty much the outtakes of Invisible Man, where Invisible Man is reading a journal by, by a character named Leroy. And he says the following. Uh, can't read it. Let's see, I would like to be president not for the power and the alleged glory, but for the perspective. What does he see from where he stands? What does he think when he cannot sleep in the deep, vast middle of the night? Is that deep, vast middle a quote? What does he feel when he sees me, my, my black, questioning face of negation staring out of the white affirmative crowd, not smiling, just staring? The nature of my questioning revealed without a mask because unobserved in the crowd which has eyes only for the man of power. What happens when the man of power is black? How does it change this equation? If Ellison had seen Obama elected president, I think he would have said something along these lines. Quotation from my old mentor from college, Ralph Ellison's literary executor, John Callahan. To be an American in 2014, whether on the higher or lower frequencies, is to live in a state of contradiction, kindred to that contra condition explored in Invisible Man more than 60 years ago. Subtly and not so subtly, invisibility persists. An African American be, can be elected and re-elected president, yet continue to be seen as other than American by a frightening number of his fellow citizens. And like Todd Clifton, who was shot to death by a policeman around the corner from the New York Public Library in the pages of Invisible Man, young black men are in danger of being killed by policemen whose inner eyes see something other than the actual unarmed person in front of them. So I'll move toward a conclusion here. Think about this, Ralph Ellison witnessing the deaths of Trayvon Martin 
and Eric Gardner and Michael Brown and Tamir Rice and Walter Scott. The growing catalog of unarmed men shot down either by policemen or by vigilantes standing in as law enforcement in the case of Trayvon Martin. It struck me going through the airport that this was the cover of a national magazine, Black Lives Matter. Now there's certain cynicism that can come up and say, well, time's a little late to this <laughs> whole message. But I think it does mean something when such a middle of the road, your grandma reads it, dentist office type of magazine is making that kind of affirmative statement, blurring out the name of the magazine in favor of these words. What does it mean to be black and American? What does it mean to be black and poor and American? A black male in the center of a city, potentially subject to police force with killing power, yet still holding on to the flag, wanting to connect to what it means to be an American. The faces, some of the faces, men and women, who have been subject to this kind of violence. How do we change it? What would Ellison have thought? Well, to give some perspective on that, I dug into Ellison's FBI record, because Ellison, like a number of black people today, felt under surveillance. And sometimes, as the old adage goes, just because you're paranoid doesn't mean that they aren't after you. <laughs> And the FBI kept a long record of Ellison from the 40s with his early writings in radical press to the later years of his life. I wanted to call attention to one message, though, one little insert from 1942. A conference that Ellison attended where the theme was words can be bullets. Words can be bullets. The idea of literature of writing of any kind being a kind of weapon for political action. That same year, Ralph Ellison sent a letter to his friend and literary sparring partner Richard Wright, the author of Native Son. And he wrote something along these lines. I think it is because this past which filters through your book has always been tender and alive and aching within us. We are the ones who had the no comforting amnesia of childhood and for whom the trauma of passing from country to the city of destruction brought no anesthesia of unconsciousness but left our nerves peeled and quivering. We are not the numbed but the seething. God, it makes you want to write and write and write or murder. <laughs> Think of this, two young writers thinking about what their art can achieve, what writing can do, what art can do, what's the purpose of it at a time of political strife and necessary action. Well, I think Ellison would ask the same question today. Yes, we can take to the streets and protest, but those of us who have the capacity to do it, there's a power in writing to redirect one's energy, even murderous energy, into creation into something generative and transformative. That's certainly what Ellison did. So I want to end with this. Ralph Ellison looking at you. What would you see about America today? What would you see in this crowd? With all of your differences. And those are just differences I can see. The diversity that is within each of us the ways that we define our individual identity based upon factors well beyond race and ethnicity and class. What would Ralph Ellison see when he saw you? I think the answer to that lies at the end of Invisible Man and to a particular line to which I alluded to earlier. And it is this which frightens me. Who knows whether on the lower frequencies I speak for you. Invisible Man, after all, is a novel that begins with I and ends with you. And in that journey from the first person, singular, out to the second person, it connects the possibility of community, of shared experience. Look how he initially writes it. This is in the, the draft right before publication, an ultimate draft of the book. 
what else would try to tell you what re really went on when your eyes were looking through? And who knows with that, I speak for you, but he's done something here. If you can see it through the grainy print, he's written the phrase on the lower frequencies, then crossed it out. Thank God he had the, the vision to put it back in because that concept of the lower frequencies is so resonant. It brings in Kendrick Lamar and the sound of the beat. The things that allow us all to bob our heads in the same way. The thing that connects us across difference and distance. The things that helps us understand that an individual, whether a young rapper from Compton, California, or a young writer from Oklahoma City, Oklahoma, can in fact speak for you no matter who you may be. And so this idea of our collective Americanness, of the things that bring us together, is at the center of what Ellison is about. He had a sense of hope, but not op optimism. Optimism can be foolish, short-sighted, Pollyanna. Hope is about promise, is about possibility, even in the face of great obstacles. Ellison held on to hope a hope for our country and a hope for each of us to find our place within a multiracial American democratic future. Thank you so much. <laughs> we got any time for a yeah, question or two? Great. Any thoughts, provocations? <laughs> I'm just warming up. Come on, guys, let's do it. <laughs> yes, sir. Um, so my question is a little convoluted, so give me a sec. No, um, go for it. So personally, when I listen, when I've listened to Kendrick Lamar and when I've read Invisible Man, Richard Wright, and Toni Morrison, I, mostly because I'm white, had a tendency to say that is what it's like to be black. That yeah. is being black in America. And then I get to walk away from whatever that is. Mm. <laughs> yeah. Whereas someone who is black has to live that on a day to day basis. So, what is the place of white people in studying mm. African studies and hip hop and African American culture? Man, that's, that's some. Y'all get that? It's, it's great question. A lot of stuff there. Let me take a, a shot at a couple things. First of all, there are, I haven't looked at the census lately, but. There are maybe 35 million ways of being black in America, something like that. So part of it is, is just overcoming. And this is true not just for, for, pe for people who aren't black, but for those of us who are black as well, to understand that no one experience defines us. And there are different times in history where certain public expressions of blackness become the dominant, to which then you either have to pretend like you're a part of, or you have to just adamantly resist and risk being socially ostracized. <laughs> you know, in college for me, just to give you a tangible one, there, I, I started college the year that Spike Lee's Malcolm X came out, and all the brothers on campus had the Malcolm X hats. And so me, a biracial kid from Salt Lake City, Utah, what did I do? I ordered every single damn color of the Malcolm X hat. I had the, the purple and gold, I had the black and silver, I had the red and white, and that was part of me trying to announce, I'm down. I'm part of that experience, <laughs> you know, when I didn't need to. I was already, my, I was fated by my biology to be part of this experience, however I wish to define it. So part of it as, as, a, as you say, a white person, and, and that too is a tricky identity, because that can mean a hell of a lot of things. <laughs> Got to trace your, your, your roots to see where you're from. You might be a Swede or a, an Irishman or who knows. God knows some combination thereof. The point being is to, to take works of art and to understand that they aren't necessarily representative of a cultural whole. And, that, and that's going against a lot of history that tells us otherwise. You know, this idea that there can be only one black leader, or that, that somehow every writer has to be writing for the race. <laughs> that's hard work to undo, and yet it's, it's necessary. And I think it's becoming easier in your generation. I guess I can say that now. It makes me feel old, but <laughs> yeah, y'all's generation, you young, young whippersnappers, to. Uh, <laughs> To, to start to you know, let those lines melt down. Of course, 
that comes with a responsibility also to acknowledge and respect difference, not to slip into colorblindness. So there's a delicate balance between over-determining race in a work of, of, of art and then ignoring it. <laughs> there's got to be a way to, to acknowledge, to celebrate, to understand difference and to understand where you, where and where, you know, how and where you enter that piece of, of literature or music or whatever and to know that it can, you can gain certain purchase on it that's p valuable. You know, I always say, and this is you know, something I stole from my old professor, Cornell West, he said that African American studies and Africana studies wouldn't exist unless white people could also study it. Unless, I mean, if, if there was a, a skin color test to, to do something, then it's, not a, then it's completely identity driven. It's not a field of study. For something like Africana studies to be a field of study, it has to be something where you can decide, I want to be a professor of this. And you can study it and through dint of your effort become a, 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 a kind of a knowledgeable and powerful in understanding a certain area of it. But with a, a humility, knowing that you don't, do not necessarily have that direct biological connection. It's a dance, but it's an important one to, to learn if we're going to live together. You know, that's a really, really important question. Thank you for that. Yes, sir. Mm -hmm. um, like, I don't identify myself as being like whatever my heritage is that American um, is there like a tangible benefit to keeping ties and being African American or does that just kind of silo you yeah. in a direction from being just a part of patriotism of being American yeah that's, that's an important question to ask particularly through Ellison's lens yeah. because Ellison was one of the, the greatest expositors of American as an, as an identity and of black people at, at the center not at the margins of it but he was writing against a tradition that did marginalize black experience from the American experience. And so the reason why Jesse Jackson and others in the 80s popularized the concept of African American was to reassert a sense of heritage, connection, and pride and as a way of, of using that term American without effacing and erasing blackness. Now, are we at a time now where, where we can give up with that? I don't know. I've seen a move more toward the term black. You know, rather than African American, and maybe there's something in that negotiation there, a less self-conscious assertion of identity, a more natural wearing of it. But it's, you know, it's only time will tell, and we may need to <laughs> bring the term back if things keep going the way they are. Uh, but the, I think Ellison, though, he, and this is where he was, I think, most instructive to your point. He wrote an article in 1970 in Time magazine called What America Would Be Like Without Blacks. And the editors of Time Magazine commissioned this article from him. And in it, he essentially says that to understand uh, what America, basically America wouldn't exist without black, America, without black Americans, that whatever else a true American is, he is also somehow black. I think those are the direct words. Whatever else a true American is, he is also somehow black. And he means that on the level of culture, that on the level of culture, the melting pot has already melted. You know, no salad bowls, no you know, other analogies on the level of culture. We've melted. If you need any sign of that, you know, take a look at, geez, take a look at uh, Miley Cyrus, even Taylor Swift. <laughs> Taylor Swift, Kendrick Lamar, best of friends, by the way, which is another strange footnote <laughs> to this. Maybe we'll, another lecture, we can get into that. But, but yeah, I mean, it's a really important question, though, because I think it has to do with the, the erasure of that heritage. You know, for most Americans who are not black, y'all know where you came from. For most black Americans, unless you're recent immigrants, that experience is, is, is lost to history largely. So part of it is about a reclamation of that, of that connection. But it's always in flux. The nature of identity is always in flux. And it's, it's part of, it's a good to question and to think about it like you are. Another thing or two? These are good questions, by the way. Man, you can have me all ready for my graduate class on Wednesday. <laughs> yes? Um, so I just got hired to teach at a high school next year in Alabama. Excellent. Congratulations. Um, thank you. And I'm teaching at a school whose demographics are 97% black and 97% under the poverty line. Wow. 
what I wanted to do, but I'm very interested in bringing in literature that they can relate to, um, like the Mark Wilson. So I was wondering if you have any other recommendations of books that you feel like um, they should read to like understand their identity. Well, a couple things. One, one is that the the act of reading literature is always about the process of empathy and relation. So whether you're reading Dostoevsky's Crime and Punishment, or you're reading you know, uh, Virginia Woolf's uh, To the Lighthouse or whatever, there's, there's a process of, of relation that needs to be engaged. That said, there are ways where you can make that jump easier when you're trying to teach certain fundamental aspects of, of analysis and you know, certain skills in the language arts. And so one of the things that I've been doing in high schools and middle schools is a program called Hip Hop in the Classroom where we begin by using lyrics as a means to think about literature as a gateway drug of sorts, you know, as a, you know, so you can talk a little about Kendrick Lamar or Jay-Z or Nicki Minaj or whomever, Eminem, as a, as a means to, to learn certain practices of close reading and analysis that you then can bring to the canonical works that the, the students will be tested on for the AP exam, for instance. So one of the things is to to try to draw upon the in, in, innate knowledge and, the, and experience of your students to let them guide some of the directions you take. And I certainly do that when I work with, with song lyrics. But then also to, to challenge students to know that they can re, you know, meet the challenge and that you can give them something that is not in any way directly related to their own circumstance, but through dint of their uh, empathy and their process of intellection, they can narrow that gap, and in doing so, that is a powerful, powerful lesson in that. But let's be in touch because I, I'm, I'm working to, to kind of get some of this lyric work into high schools. I'm working with the Smithsonian right now on a project that uses uh, pop lyrics from across all genres to teach the language arts at middle schools and high schools. So we, we should definitely be in touch. Yes? Yeah. Certain aspects of it. And so I, mean, I just got a picture uh, of Chief Keef in my head as yeah. you're saying that. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> um, but being able to, I guess, the way that Ralph Ellison would be able to look to Duke Ellington, mm -hmm. um, you know, just something that I think about is how we have to Huh. Huh. Well, you know, there was an image that I went fast past because I already knew I was I was running long of, of Kendrick and Tupac, yeah. you know, young Kendrick. And you know, at the end of the album, he has that conversation with Tupac where he takes an old interview that Tupac gave and splices in his own questions and they have a dialogue. And it's a really fascinating document, you know, a sonic document to think about that constructed conversation of, of what's missing and, and how and, and the, you know, the artificiality of it and the necessary artificiality because Tupac isn't here to have that conversation for real. So there's, there is, I think, a, a deficit of, of uh, dis, uh, for, the, for the descendants of hip hop's golden age, I think. Although a lot of those folks are still around. I'm, I'm working right now to bring out a, a history of hip hop with the Smithsonian again to, to tell that story, you know, working with Chuck D and MC Light and, and Africa Bambata, some of these originators. And it's been really instructive as a hip hop fan, but not a pr practitioner, to sit in that room and hear them talk among each other about what story they want to leave for those who follow. So I think that that, that earlier generation is there if we're willing to hear them. They have plenty to say. And for young artists like Kendrick Lamar, one of his 
great strengths is that he's willing to listen. He's willing to hear that past and still have his eyes on a, an artistic future that's distinctly his own. Yeah. Um, speaking about pop culture and specifically some of the criticisms that artists like Iggy Azalea and Macklemore have come um, yeah. under fire for things like cultural appropriation. Yes, yes. Um, where, what's your perspective on the line between appreciating an art form mm. from where it comes from and then adopting parts of that art form in your expression that aren't like parts of your own cultural experience like the yeah. Zaley Macklemore or yeah. like that I've been accused of doing? Well, you know, Ellison tended to be very liberal about this and I share a lot of his beliefs. He, in, in being an expositor of the vernacular process, was of a mind that all culture is based on appropriation of some form of fashion. And that you really couldn't have African American culture without some appropriative actions involved. So it would be, it's dangerous to castigate a certain group of people for doing it without also looking at how it's happening in other places. Now that, of course, there are all sorts of differences of power and institutional position in this that complicate matters. But nonetheless, I think Ellison drew a line between appropriation and banalization. You know, the banalization of culture is when you, you take something and you, you debase it, you detach it entirely from its context, show no sense of awareness of that previous context, and, and profit from it. So using that model, someone like Elvis does not fit. Elvis Presley, for instance, who's often, you know, Chuck D once said, Elvis was a hero to most, but he never meant shit to me. <laughs> and his meaning there was that he saw Elvis as an appropriator. Well, I don't think he thinks that anymore. Chuck D doesn't think that anymore as he's grown and, and thought more. Because what you see with Elvis is somebody who was poor, was white, yes, but grew up listening to black music, grew up in a context that really wasn't that separated from the black artists who were creating the music that he loved. And he went on to fashion it in a way that, that where he wasn't aping black culture in, the, in his sound. He, you know, his, certainly his dance moves didn't <laughs> show much of the influence of black culture. <laughs> and he made something his own. Iggy Azalea is more complex. Australian, who somehow sounds like she grew up, you know, Decatur or something, Georgia. I don't know. I mean, it, it's certainly an affect to what she's doing. It's a stylization. But is it any more stylized than Lady Gaga in her prime wearing the meat dress and doing, I mean, it's racialized in a way that makes it more of a hot button issue in this, in this cultural moment but it's, it's of a piece with a kind of appropriation that we see done artfully well. So the question should be with Iggy Azalea, can she rap? And if she can't, then it's okay to like her, but know that you're liking her for other reasons than the fact that, that she's a good rapper. You know, as one of my colleagues said, there's a long history in America of white audiences wanting to listen to black music without black people. <laughs> And you know that's that's something that we ought to think about. Is it, but it's it's not on the on the on the feet of the the white artists who are trying their best to create something beautiful and impactful and to make some money along the way. To to do that, it's on us as an audience and as a culture to think about what it is we're doing and why, and to be honest with ourselves about why we favor certain artists over others. You know, but it's it's a really important question. Cool. We good? Hey, y'all, this was wonderful. Thank you so much for having me. Thanks for coming out.